Dave's career in technology spans across three decades, which includes roles in sales, product management, product strategy, marketing, and engineering. If that isn't enough, he has been CEO of three different VC-backed companies and a VP at Unisys, IBM, Microsoft, and Amazon. His current role at Amazon is VP of AWS Marketplace. In his current role um, at AWS Marketplace, Dave is at the forefront of cloud computing. And without stealing too much of his thunder, AWS Marketplace is changing the way enterprises procure and consume software. I had the pleasure to work with Dave last summer during my internship at Amazon. During my second week, I had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Dave to discuss my project. The meeting was in the evening, so naturally, Dave poured me a glass of scotch. As we discussed my project and what Dave wanted me to achieve throughout summer, I witnessed how passionate Dave was about moving technology forward to improve the customer experience and how passionate he was about scotch. I left the meeting with a long to-do list and a nice buzz. Dave is a humble and hum humorous leader, and I'm excited to welcome her him here today. So without further ado, Dave McCann. Thank you all. All right, good morning. good morning. Hopefully you can understand my accent. It's Scottish. It is a form of English. Um, <laughs> and I'll tell you a funny joke about that in a minute. And um, these guys have been helping shape the talk this morning. And we met with two groups of students and your faculty to discuss what I might give emphasis to. So hopefully we can use the slides. I treat slides as a smorgasbord. You're going to eat off the slide and you try and, you know, the slide is just a mechanism to provoke conversation. So I think what I can help you on is, you know, you're all very bright people. You've invested a lot of your intellect in your second degree or perhaps your third degree. And so you're an incre incredibly talented person and you're going to enjoy some phenomenal employers. And so how do we give you some thoughts on how you turn your intellect and your passion into being a leader in whatever you choose as your career? So let's get ahead on that. You know, Jeff Bezos, who I've only had the privilege of maybe meeting seven or eight times in my two and a half years at Amazon, Jeff's a really bright bloke. He's put down some constructs of running a business that I think are frankly breathtaking. Um, and he talked about failure and invention are inseparable twins. When I first came to Silicon Valley in 1988, one of my bosses said, fail faster, but learn from your mistakes and don't make the same mistake three times. I'll forgive you twice, three times and you're gone. And so we're all learning machines. Every one of us in this room is a learning machine. We're human, but we really learn from our experiences. And one of the great things I've learned at AWS and Amazon is innovation involves learning from failure. You never get it right first time. And so if you're faint hearted and you think you're gonna get it right first time, you're completely wrong. You know, most invention comes from a lot of serial attempts and you learn from every attempt and mistake. Um, these guys actually wanted to have me talk about me. I don't particularly like that. I'd rather get on to cloud. But the, the question might be, how did I get where I am? And is there anything you can learn from me? I'm not sure you want to learn much from me. Um, I'm Scottish. We only have nine universities in Scotland. Scotland's a really small country. It's the same size as South Carolina. So I measure everything in America in South Carolinas. Like <laughs> California's five South Carolinas, right? Um, and Scotland is one South Carolina. And I went to college thinking I'd been an interpreter, studying French, Spanish, and Russian. And after about half a semester, I really didn't like old French. And I thought, all right, I'm in the wrong course. And I flipped to economics and history. And when I graduated, there weren't enough software programmers. And so the computing companies wanted to hire you and retrain you if you were a linguist and good at math. And so I interviewed with IBM and Unisys, and eventually I stumbled into Unisys with no cleverness. And then, you know, they said, all right, if you can handle Russian and you can handle math, you're going to be fine with Fortran. And so, you know, you, so basically you went down a Fortran or a Pascal or a COBOL class and you picked up some of the basics. And I've stumbled through a bunch of companies. I think one of my teachings would be don't have a formal plan. Life is going to present you with 300 opportunities. There is not one path to success. I'm a sailor. And if you're going to sail to Catalina Island from Dana Point, the wind is going to change direction, and you can tack and jibe on your yacht. You'll still have a great career. You doesn't have to be in a straight line. So get comfortable with the fact that you're going to take some wrong turns. You might fall overboard. You could get wet, but it's okay. You'll probably get there. 
Um, you know, I've worked, I started off, believe it or not, because I studied at the Soviet Institute and I did my thesis on the comparative effect of a centrally planned economy under Stalin versus, say, Wilsonian economics. But because I was at the Soviet Institute, we did a lot of work around industrial relations and trade unionism. And Mobile Oil had a secret theory that they hired guys out at the Soviet Institute to go work on oil rigs with very aggressive Scottish trade unionists. And so I got stuck in an oil rig halfway to Norway and I did an employment law, which I didn't really want to do. And I spent the first year half of my life doing industrial relations with techs and drilling superintendents who wanted to deal with people like me who were, I came from a steel town in Scotland. And that was not, and I learned that I'd made a bad choice and that I was not the personality for doing that. And so I learned that your personality and your passion matter in your job. And I quit. And I went back to Unisys and got into a job with Unisys and went into the legal and banking team with no strategic intention other than I wanted to be in computing and then got given a bunch of courses, spent some time in the legal and banking team in sales, got bored with sales and they phoned up and they said, you keep really understand our product, you should move into product management. And I moved into product management and a few years later the guys in the plant in Silicon Valley said, you know, you really understand our software, you should move to Silicon Valley and work with our engineers. And through no strategy, no intention, I, had no, I, I just wanted to have fun. I ended up in Silicon Valley with a spin-off from Intel that was doing database optimization for the banks, where if the Fed Reserve of Boston wants to clear N billion a night, whether you can clear those billions really is overnight interest rate, it matters. And so how fast you clear your databases. And I then went off, did a spin-off with a company called MapInfo, where we sold a division. We did some mapping software. It's geospatial. Where do you put cell towers? How do you calculate tax rates? Got into object-oriented software. Moved down to Orange County, found Laguna Beach. My wife told me I wasn't moving. I had to decide that my career was Orange County for a decade. Did a bunch of startups down there, including one in El Segundo called carparts.com. Um, Joined a company in Costa Mesa, got bought by IBM. That was not a strategy, that was an acquisition. You can have a career that is a victim of acquisition. So you can sometimes go through companies. And you know, what did I learn along the journey? First thing I learned is you need a sense of humor. You know, life is going to prevent, present you with a lot of unplanned stuff. And you can either be really miserable or laugh it off. And I encourage you to laugh it off. And if you don't want to laugh it off, drink a lot. <laughs> right? And so I do both. Uh, <laughs> you know, because you're going to go through your career and you can't plan it. Life just, you know, my sister likes to say that, you know, men make plans and God laughs. Now, I'm not a God believer anymore. I'm post-Christian. So, you know, pick your religion. But the reality is that life is serendipitous and you're going to work for 40 years. So, you know, you're going to change direction. Um, but in every role, you're going to have goals. You're going to have to take risk. You are going to fail. It's okay to fail. You will learn from failure. And in fact, your failure in one company is success for the next company. And they go, wow, we really want to hire you because you worked over there. And I'm going, like, yeah, but we went chapter 11. And they went, yeah, but you were working on this chip. Okay, well, we're working on the same chip. Oh, really? But I chapter 11 over here. Yeah, but our model's different. Oh, so the model was wrong, not the chip. So I failed on the chip, but it wasn't really the chip. It was the model. So my failure over here is a PhD over here. This, people here wanted to lay me off. People over here wanted to pay me lots of money. What was the difference? 24 hours. Literally, subscriber computing got bought on the Monday. The deal got approved at midday. The management team walked in and said, we only buy IP. We don't buy the management team. You're fired. I was 37. I had a mortgage, a kid, a house in Dana Point, and I was laid off. And I was pretty shaken up at 36 years of age. Thought my proverbial didn't stink, and I was unemployed. But the owner of the company said, you know, I own four other companies. Love what you did here. You're moving to this one tomorrow. Next day, I was the CEO of another company called SOS Wireless, which led to Telelogic, which led to Car Parts, which led to FileNet. And all of those were connected because of a headhunter who hired CEOs. And the only connection there is the headhunter who moved me from job to job. And so I really love this guy called Bruce Lachenhauer, who got me four jobs in Orange County. Nothing about me, all about Bruce Lachenhauer. Right? And he had a senior VP job at FileNet. And he said, hey, Dave, you're the CEO of Car Parts. They want somebody who's run a billion-dollar product line. I'd run a billion-dollar product line for Unisys. And he said, you're the only guy in Orange County I know who's run a billion-dollar product line. FileNet wants to get a billion. You're in. And I was like, who's FileNet? I had no clue what they did. 
but they were doing document management on object databases for banks. It was back to my banking experience in 1984, but now it's 2004, and my 1984 experience was relevant in 2004 in Orange County, and it's like weird. So what you accumulate is something you will always leverage. And all the way along, it's about achieving goals, stretching yourself, um, and take risk, and have fun, and laugh a lot. And treat everybody you work with with respect because you don't know when they're going to crop up in your career. And I got into one called Subscriber Computing. CFO and I had it off. He, got, he left Subscriber, went down the hall. Two years later, he raises a round of money. They're going to go public. I get a phone call saying, we need a chief operating officer. We're IPOing in seven months. The CEO is an engineer. Would you like to run sales, marketing, engineering, and professional services? And I'm like, sure, sounds really good. The CFO called me. He said, I love working with you at Subscriber. And it was simply because I'd worked well with him for nine months. And he said, I trust you. Earn trust at Amazon's a value. I got a phone call and I ended up in subscriber. I did my first IPO. Sheer serendipity. So be serendipitous. All right, so that's 30 years of randomness. Came to Silicon Valley for a year. Told my mum, you're Catholic, you want to live in Rome. I'm in software, I need to live in America. That's all she could understand. And you know, 29 years later, I'm still stuck on the West Coast. And my mum keeps asking when I'm going home. All right, so, and then I moved from Silicon Valley to Southern California, and then, you know, Seattle's become a, a hotbed. I got headhunted out of IBM. I went to Seattle, and in Seattle, it's all about Microsoft and Amazon. And I did a startup, fell out with the PE fund, got headhunted into Microsoft, didn't like Microsoft, did another startup, sold that, made a decent amount of money, but I still need to work. And then I got a phone call literally the day I'd come back from the Amazon. And I'd done a guy trip down the Amazon with seven buddies, one of those life things you do. And I came off the plane and I thought it was a joke because this guy said, I'm hiring for Amazon. And I'm like, I just came from the Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> and I got a call to join Amazon. And I'm like, I don't think I want to join Amazon. I want to do a startup. And they said, well, Amazon really is like a set of startups. I said, okay, I'll take the interview. And I took the interview and I wish I'd joined Amazon years ago because we're a collection of startups. Now, that Amazon affects everything you do. And I did this diagram for fun. My son's doing his master's in Chicago and I gave a talk to his computer science faculty. Every one of you is touched by cloud. So I'm pivoting now from my career to cloud and I've stumbled into cloud with no thoughtfulness. And in cloud, you know, your burgers, your movies, how you watch your baseball experience, your Kaplan education, your credit card, your Coca-Cola, your Spotify, all runs on AWS. So your entire digital experience as a consumer is running on AWS cloud, right? So Spotify runs 100% on AWS. Um, you know, I was just at McDonald's. They're moving a whole bunch of their consumer experience to AWS. They also run some on Azure. Um, Netflix was built on AWS. I was with the CTO last Tuesday night of Netflix. All the visualization of the baseball runs on AWS. It uses you know, a whole bunch of large computing IoT technologies around baseball. Um, Capital One's doing some really unusual things in credit card. Coca-Cola North America right now is closing a data center. I, I deal with Ann Carver, the CIO, and she's moving her entire data center onto AWS. Everything you touch is going to cloud. So no matter whether you go into banking, utilities, retail, healthcare, cloud computing is an economic disruptor. And it's doing some things that are bizarre and unusual. And you know, we're living in a world that everything is software. So I encourage you to understand software. Doesn't mean you need to be a computer programmer, but you need to understand systems and how systems are transforming supply chains. So every supply chain in the industry, and I know as part of your MBA, you're doing the whole supply chain issue. I'm in the supply chain of software. Global spend on software. Anybody know how much the global spend on software is? What's the global spend on IT? Anybody know? What's the GDP of the planet? Okay, GDP of the planet, according to The Economist, is 72 trillion. Largest economy in the world is the EU, right, which is two trillion bigger than the US, even though Donald Trump doesn't agree. And the, re the reality is that you've really got big economies. Global IT is over three trillion. So 4% of the global economy is technology. So it's gonna to touch your career wherever you go. And cloud computing is basically about the next generation of computing, which is very scalable and very flexible. What does scalable mean? It just means big. In the old day, you bought a server, you phoned up a company like HP, Dell, and IBM, you waited four months, the server showed up, you hired a bunch of geeks, three, three weeks later, the code was on the server, you tested it, see if it broke, and from the day you wanted to buy the server to you actually switch on 50 servers was six months. 
You couldn't start writing code, then you built the app, took you nine months. So from concept to execution of idea of an application at Bank of America was 15 months. That's five quarters. CEOs like, I want to go quick. Buy servers, build code, fund people, get code running, 15 months. There's a data warehousing platform that everybody uses to close the quarter called Teradata. Teradata it takes you six months to order a $10 million machine. In the cloud, Brad, who works here, one of your fellow graduates on my team, we write the Teradata software in a JSON description tool, it's a JavaScript notation tool. We write a description in Teradata, and where Coca-Cola used to wait nine months to get a Teradata appliance, you can switch on Teradata data warehousing in 48 minutes. And we run software in 14 regions around the world. You can go buy Teradata, run in Germany, 48 minutes later, it's running in Frankfurt. Run it in Korea. So we've gone from nine months of procurement to 48 minutes of deployment. I can start doing things for my bank nine months sooner. That's transformational. So big companies are going to the cloud for what they call agility. They want to reduce their costs. They can't predict stuff, so you don't need to. Just use what you need. Um, they want lots of cool stuff. They want to go global in minutes because we're in a global economy. And that 72 trillion economy is very global. And so this is why people are going to the cloud, whether it's, by the way, Amazon, Azure, IBM, I've worked for all three, so Microsoft, IBM, Amazon, then you might have Google, and then you could have NTT, Docomo, or T-Mobile, or somebody else, or Alibaba in China. So that's kind of cloud computing. Cloud computing will touch you as a career. Why do you care? Because whatever your business process is that you choose to be in, mortgage and card, your longest consumer relationship is a mortgage, right? You have a 30-year mortgage. You have a 20-year life policy. So the people who actually have the longest running data on you are the government, because you're going to pay tax for your life. So the government, the mortgage companies, and the insurance companies have what we call a long-running transaction. Buy mortgage, 1987, still own it in 2017. That's a 30-year transaction. You exist in that database for 30 years. It came off a mainframe, it went client server, it went into the cloud and your data is still up there, and your PII and information is up there. So whether you do mortgage, credit card trading, web design, you do big data, we now keep data on everything, uh, it's an enterprise back office, you're doing supply chain with SAP, you need to understand cloud computing. Because as a business person, you're going to use it as a competitive weapon, and we all live in a capitalist economy. And technology is just a tool. But if you don't understand the hammer and the nail, you're not going to build a house. So you can be very bright, but you need to understand it. And our customers are on a journey. This is an official slide. I literally was giving this talk last week at um, Discover Card in Chicago or Nike. I was having dinner with the VP of Architecture at Nike. You know, Nike right now is spinning up development and tests. This is a talk they gave publicly, so I can talk about it. So Nike is moving the development tests and their websites on us, their consumer experience, uh, maybe changing what they're doing on mobile. Uh, Coca-Cola is migrating a data center. Data centers cost money. If I can rent servers off AWS and Azure, why do I need a data center? Data centers are closing down. GE has announced they're closing 40% of their data centers, right? And just rent the stuff. It's just software. And so really, there's a massive shift across IBM, Google, Microsoft, you know, all of the big cloud vendors where customers are moving from data centers to the cloud, and they're going faster. You're going to graduate and work in a go faster world where you need to go fast. Speed matters. Right? An application for a business needs to be out in 60 days, not six months. Right? Six months is too long, it's two quarters. Consumers are on mobile. They want a better app tomorrow morning. Right now, for me, the best app that I can experience is I just rented a car. I was flying down yesterday to Orange County with my daughter, and I forgot to book a car, and I thought, wow, I'll just go to my phone, and the Enterprise app is phenomenal. UX design, bar none, go rent a car off the Enterprise app, and I thought, I just want to hire the designer. You know, it was pick location, choose car, pick up the last car I rented in Chicago last week, same model, thank you very much. Use card, here's my account number, click, 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 card book, thank you. What am I? A happy consumer and they got 300 bucks off me, right? That's what the world's about. So we're growing fast, AWS is growing fast, cloud is growing fast, millions of customers. We work with a bunch of startups. You know, my son's into Reddit, runs on AWS, it's owned by Condé Nast. It's just content publication. Right? And it's on the mobile phone, and we've all got mobile phones. Believe it or not, I actually worked for the guy who built the first mobile phone, Marty Cooper, VP of Engineering at Motorola. And, you know, you talk to Marty, he lives down in uh, Del Mar. He didn't anticipate that there'd be billions of phones. 
He switched on the first phone, it's on his mantelpiece, he owns the patent, on the first cell phone in America, switched on in 1982. And great guy. So now everybody designs for the cloud, Twilio, you who know who they are, your Pinterest, Slack. It's just everybody's a software company. How many software companies are funded every year in North America? 800. So, you know, venture capital funds about 800 new companies a year. How many A-round companies succeed? Less than one in 10. Nine out of 10 A-round companies never survive. You go through your B, you go through your C, you don't get out. If you don't get to 100 million, you just get bought up by a private equity fund. Little guys get bought by big guys. But VC capital, America is the capital of software. It's why we have such a phenomenal economy. By the way, this is the year that India passes the US. There are 20 million developers on the planet. Until now, America's had more developers than any other country in the world. This year, India passes us for the first time. They're graduating more computer science graduates than we are in America, more than China. And so India passes us this year as an American country. I say us as my schizophrenic American half. Um, but the reality is America is still pretty innovative and their big weapon is venture capital, right? We're unique on that. We have four venture, 400 venture capital funds. I had to pitch 26 to get a round one time to do my B round. And venture capital is a unique American asset. Germany and Britain don't have it. The banks are too conservative. So we've got a unique risk culture in this country. You're very lucky living in America. We're the most risk-oriented culture with lots of money. Meanwhile, public companies are also going to the cloud to drive down costs, to drive up innovation. Comcast Xfinity, front end of it runs on AWS. I was dealing with the Comcast guys last week. So stuff you get every day, doesn't matter whether it's healthcare, banking, Hertz, um, Autodesk, everybody's moving to cloud computing, but they're just doing it to satisfy their customer, to innovate more quickly, to drive down their use of capital, because we're all capitalists. And whether you're owned by a VC, a private equity fund, or you're publicly traded on a stock market, it's still about revenue growth. Value of a company is the future of its value on its trend line for top line growth and its predictability and future opportunity for net profit. And those are your two indexes for value. Is your top line growth high and is your future to net profit good? And if, you, if we think you've got future net profits and you've got great growth, your stock's going up. And if either of those don't, you're new, you, you got laid off like the CEO of Ford this morning, right? Wasn't driving the top line, certainly wasn't driving the bottom line. And really, we're all just hamsters on a wheel, right? And CEOs are just hamsters on a playbook. And the playbook is top line growth, growth and net profit with innovation. And that's what you'll be doing. And even government is getting into cloud um, all the way to the intelligence agencies. Brad and I are involved in a couple of projects where we run a marketplace. We run a software store for the intelligence agencies. Why? Because they want to get the code running faster for the next CIA project. They call it missions. So this was a slide from Condé Nast. So here's the guys that own Reddit. And the VP of infrastructure at Condé Nast was discussing why did I go to cloud in front of a room. And Condé Nast said, we need to go to cloud because we want to get content to market faster. It's hard to try new things on our old platforms. Our infrastructure is static and it involves a lot of capital and the publishing industry is under incredible transformation and everything's going digital. And so the VP at Condé Nast said, I need to be in the cloud. So all the media companies are running to cloud. So if you're heading into media, it's all about cloud. Video rendering for TV, content publishing to the phone, paper's going to die, newspapers are just going to become digital, News UK is on it. Everybody's on cloud. So this was the Condé Nast. We need to go to cloud for creativity, productivity, agility, and flexibility. So any industry you touch is going to be touched by cloud computing. So what do we do just for fun? What's my job and how might you relate to us? So Brad graduated here four years ago. We hire him into Marketplace. Marketplace is a supply chain disruptor for a $500 billion software industry. And 40% of the world's software is bought by the top 10,000 companies. Think of the Fortune 100. Right? So whether you're Coca-Cola or a GE, any big company, huge budgets. Banks spend 8% of revenue in IT. 8%. Retailers don't have much money. They spend 1% of revenue in IT. Pharma spends about 4% of revenue in IT. So you run into somebody and you go, okay, so you're a $50 billion company. You're in the pharma industry. Therefore, you spend $2 billion in IT. $2 billion. 60% of its people. Okay, that's $1.2 billion. A, the other 40% is infrastructure, data, and software. So you can parse the spending of a company 
and walk in and go, okay, so if you're a $100 billion company and you're in retail, you have a $1 billion budget. Or if you're a $50 billion bank, you've got a $2 billion investment and it's people and it's technology and it's innovation. So we supply the software store so they can switch the software on in minutes. Amazon and Azure are fighting over building what we call platform as a service. Platform as a service is just lots of hammers and nails. Lots of tools for geeks, right? And is it a database tool? Is it a BI tool? Is it an internet of things tool? What's the hammer and the nail? You need to understand what does cloud software look like? You don't need to be able to code it, but any company you go run and you're bright and you're an exec, you're gonna be using geeks. And those geeks are gonna be basically using tools from Azure, IBM, Amazon, Google, four or five of the big platforms to make everything you do run faster. Analytics is really hot right now. Mobile services is really hot. Internet of Things says that everything we do is measured. The ultimate thing is your body. The next three waves of computing are we've digitized the phone, we've digitized the office. So what are the next three things we're gonna digitize? The car, because you move around in it. We all know about that one. The house, because you live in it, and the body. There's an experiment going on in Sydney right now with a chip right in the hand of the patient, and you walk into the hospital, you just swipe your hand under the scanner, and your medical record's on a chip. And really, we're just a moving expense. 18% of the US economy is healthcare, 25% of spend is in the last 18 months of your life, so it's just old people who are sick. And we wait until they get sick, and then they phone a doctor to say, why are you sick? Well, just put a chip in their hand and you know they're sick. And the doctor walks in with a control panel in the future that says, somebody's sick and they're already in the ambulance and they're arriving at your office in four minutes. So we're all just, you know, Borgs. You're gonna have a chip in you in the future. So Internet of Things is about house, car, and body. And then Marketplace is a supply chain of other software. How many software companies are there in the world? 75,000. How many really matter? About 5,000. Pareto visits every industry, by the way, for the math stats people here, right? So the reality is revenue concentrates in every market. And so revenue concentrates to software companies. And there's about 5,000 that really matter out of 75,000. So we built a store where our buyer, you've got an app store on your phone from Apple or Google. But the reality is that we're the app store for developers. So Brad and I run an app store for geeks. And if you're a builder, if you're an application developer at Nike right now, and you've got a project and you want to go in four minutes, our, store, our software is ready to go. So you want to do BI, let's go get some Tableau. If you want to go do some uh, big data, let's go get some Hadoop. And so we're a software publisher. I never thought I'd be a librarian. Is that an exciting job? I never thought of librarianship as exciting. But when I meet T-Mobile, I say, hi, I'm your librarian. And we're building a global library of code that is ready to switch on in minutes. Why? Because they can find it, they can procure it, they can run it. It's all about consumption-based society. Used to be that you bought software for five years. Well, the CIO at Nike would say, I have no clue what I'm gonna do in two years. I know what I'm doing next month. I don't wanna buy software, I just wanna rent it for the week. And when my project's over, throw it away. So it's disposable. <laughs> so we're moving very, you know this, with Uber and with cars, we're moving into the consumption society where everything's a contract. Brad's actually on the leading edge of my team. He runs our contract API. We're rewriting how you do contracts. Point click contract. Behind the scene, it's just a set of paragraphs, it's a set of JSON instructions, and a contract with you, what country you're in, Germany, what law do I have to follow, what are you spending, who regulates it, it's banking, banking in Germany, bunch of rules, code, press button. Contract and code. So that's kind of the world we live in. Now we apply principles at Amazon that I think you can take to any company you ever worked with, and IBM and Microsoft would say they apply the same principles, but every culture is a little different, and I've worked in a bunch, so I can make comparisons. Jeff Bezos wrote this great philosophy called start with the customer and work backwards. What does the customer want and only design what the customer wants? You know, Jeffrey Moore who wrote Crossing the Chasm and nine other books that some of you might have read, Jeff actually started with the same concept. He just didn't call it working backwards. But the reality is that the same thesis was what's a phenomenal experience? And you live phenomenal experience every day. You have an iPhone, you have an Android phone, you have a wonderful app you love. You're living in the world of best experience ever. But you're now going out to work in a world where every consumer is like you and they want really good experience. And a lot of experiences aren't good. So you're gonna to lean to what's a good experience and if it's frictionful, if it's got a lot of friction, you won't use it. So the whole world is focused on the customer. 
This was a Jeff Bezos diagram that we all got shown as a napkin that said, why did Amazon succeed? Lower cost, phenomenal selection, great customer experience. I have people who supply product, I've got a supply chain. And Amazon now has 20 million different products on the retail side, I'm not on retail, but Amazon retail, $100 billion company, why is it still growing at 23%? That's pretty mind boggling, find another $100 billion company, and I'm not here to brag, it's just math. $100 billion company growing at 23% because we get phenomenal choice. And my daughter is buying stuff on Amazon all day long. I have no clue what it is. I just get the bill, <laughs> right? And so I've got a 17-year-old and I've got a 22-year-old in Chicago and I just get a bill saying they bought this. And I'm like, what the hell is this? So it's phenomenal selection. They've got Prime. They have my Prime. And so they have Prime shipped to Chicago for stuff I have no clue about because it's a phenomenal experience. So apply that to every industry you're ever going to live in. And whatever industry you're in, you want world experience. So customer obsession, that's what we do. We obsess about the customer. When I was at Microsoft, we obsessed about the competition. I didn't like it. And Steve Ballmer, who I worked for, would say, Dave, you run Windows Server. What's happening with Red Hat Linux? Well, why am I wasting all this time tra 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 tracking Red Hat Linux? This is a customer. They use Windows Server. Are they happy? Well, what's Red Hat Linux doing in Vietnam? I don't really know. Well, go get my market share in Vietnam. Steve, it's 82.1%. Okay, now what does the customer need? At Amazon, we just focus on the customer. And we actually don't focus on the competition. Because if we engineer quicker for the customer, we'll win anyway. So obsess about your customer. Think big. So you've all done an MBA, you're all bright. We value people who think long term. So Jeff thinks long term. I've worked for some VCs who tell you, Dave, we're hiring you as a CEO, we're giving you seven years. And then you get in the door and they go, we weren't really giving you seven years. We're giving you three. And I literally got hired by VCs who, after they hired me, got me in, told me I had seven years, and they said, well, actually, our fund is being closed. The insurance company want their money back. You're the last company in the portfolio. You can't close a fund, which is 30 companies, until you've sold the last asset, and you're the last asset. And we want to sell the, the company. And I'm saying, hey, you called me in seven years. Yeah, you've got 37 months. That was my last company, Veroli. And I joined in February of 11. I left Microsoft. Just told her a long time. Then when I get there, one of the funds said, we need you to sell. Two of the VCs were saying, don't sell. So I'm thinking big and long term and can I get to 500 million? And one of my shareholders is going, hey, can we sell this week? And I'm like, I'm thinking about 2018. No, we need to sell now. And so think big is about horizon. It's about what can you do? It's what can you do to disrupt the world? And you can't do it overnight. Really cool stuff takes a long time because you're going to fail on the journey. So you're going to innovate, fail, learn, innovate, fail, learn, innovate, fail, learn. And eventually winning companies just innovate all the time. And then they figure out what works. And then use data. So you need to know your data, right? You need to be able to do projections. You need to be able to model. You need to be able to do, you know, what's going to happen with currencies and software in Germany, Britain and Brexit. Where's the spend? You need to be able to model demand, supply, margin, costs. Those are all really important. Another big one is take ownership. I build teams. I really value people who own stuff. When I give a task to Brad, and I'm not kissing him because he's in the room, I walk away and I think, Brad's got it. I'm going home. I don't need to worry. You only work as well. You know, as a team leader, you're only as good as the people on your team. There is no I in team. If I delegate to Brad and I say, hey, Brad, I need this pricing model for SaaS subscriptions, and I need it in 42 days, and it better be right, I can either worry and micromanage him every week, or I can just say, I trust them, I have high trust, he's going to own it, he knows he owns the deliverable, it's going to be in 41 days and it's going to be perfect. And now you've delegated to an empowered individual, you trust them, so ownership, if you're going to be in business, own it. If you give your word to somebody, you're going to deliver it, deliver it. Right? Don't promise it and fail. So how does all that work for your career? And as I think about the breadth of intellect in this room, and you're probably going to pick 40 careers, and I only know about 20 of them. So I can't give every one of you advice, but I've had a lot of group functions and I've, you know, I've got several hundred people working for me right now. Um, what skills do I want you to think about? Number one, and I'm telling this to everybody, we're living in a data society. If you don't understand the concepts of data, data visualization, how do you render a picture? Data analysis, what tool am I using to get data analyzed? What are the hot tools? And data sources, where does the data come from? Visualization, data query, and data sources. 
If you don't understand data, you're going to walk into a business tomorrow that's overwhelmed with data. They can hardly get their hands around the data. And if you're a business person, they're going to say, so you want to make a decision? What data are you using? Is that time series based? What's the cohort of the population? Are you doing a trend analysis over eight quarters? How many models have you run? Was there any machine learning in there? Is there a prediction analysis? We live in a data society and it's only going to become more data centric. So please, please, please learn about data. Analyzing data. The fastest growing job in America right now is a data engineer. I can't hire them quick enough. So I hire data engineers and then they move to another team and I hire another one. And data engineer is the hot topic, right? And people who can query and analyze data. And, you know, I heard somebody this morning talk about SQL. And SQL is kind of like an old query language that came out. You know, SQL's been around since 1992. This is 2017. This is 25 years old. So SQL's like a typewriter. It's good. You should know SQL, but we're way beyond SQL. So SQL is like VBA. You know, VBA came first, SQL came next. You need to be getting into R. And what does R do for data analysis? And then we're going to be talking to computers in the next few years, and you won't have a keyboard anyway. Right? Alexa, get me data. Cortana, get me data. Siri, get me data. Understand how to analyze data. If you want to move into development, there's lots of development jobs. Uh, you know, Python's kind of pretty hot right now. Uh, Angular JS, pick modern languages. Uh, I moved out of sales into product management. There's many things to do in product management. Planning, promotion, it's a phenomenal area, intellectually broad. Uh, marketing communications, we live in a digital world. How are you going to communicate to 2 billion consumers? What is your consumer population? How do you reach them? We don't all have the same propensity, right? So there's propensity bias that you have. Uh, everybody has a propensity bias. So I've done a lot of consumer behavioralism studies. You know, a 22-year-old in one country has a propensity to receive data differently to somebody who's 37, to me, who's 57. So the channel, the language, the medium, the package, the size, the when, we all have a different bias. So I have a million customers. I can't have one channel. I have a multi-channel reach to maybe 40 segments of my consumer base. So marketing communication is big. And then we're capitalists in most countries. So finance and accounting isn't going away. And you need to be very expert on what's happening with finance and accounting. So there's a lot of careers at Amazon. I know some of you are coming here. Uh, but whether it's Amazon, Microsoft, IBM, or anything else, there's just lots of career paths. You have to have a sense of humor, you have to have an incredible work rate, and you really want to have earned trust. You want to be inquisitive. I tell my new hires, there is no bad question. There is no embarrassing question. A question is an opportunity to learn, and we're all learning. And we're going to be learning for the rest of our lives. I'm 57. Stuff I learned three years ago is obsolete. If I don't walk into a meeting humble and inquisitive, I'm wasting that, that, that meeting. Because I need to leave that meeting better informed, equally humble, and I know a little more. But tomorrow I need to learn again. So we're all learning hamsters. Welcome to the wheel. You're on the wheel of life. We're all hamsters. But you have to have fun learning. So find something that you want to be passionate about. Because if you're not passionate about what you're learning, don't do the job. Right? I mean, I did not want to learn about oil rigs. And I did not want to be a hamster on an oil rig for 30 years. I love software, so I'll learn all day long. These are our leadership principles. I think Amazon's done some pretty cool stuff. How do you create a handbook for a company that really works? Jeff seems to have created some very simple principles. We call them guardrails. So if you believe that we have a, good, a helpful man theory, assume everybody's a good person. Assume they're reasonably well-intentioned. How do you take an intellect, point it in the right direction, get out of the way, and let that person succeed? I don't want to micromanage you. I've got hundreds of people. So you want them to be customer-obsessed. You want to trust them. When they own it, they'll deliver it. We're all trying to simplify. Complex is bad. Complex loses money. We hope you're building good judgment. We certainly want you to hire people. We don't want you to let stuff out the door that's a bad experience. We want you to think strategically and long term. Bias for action. A week is a long time. At IBM, it would take a year to get something decided. At Amazon, our culture is you've got a week. That's it. Not two weeks. Come back in a week. Learn and be curious. I mean, you have to be curious for your life. You're now incredibly proven learners. You are the pinnacle of, I've got an MBA, I went to an incredibly good university, but I'm just hiring a raw talent. I'm hiring a raw talent that could be working for 35 years, and you're going to do nine jobs. You're just going to learn nine different things. So you're going to be curious for the rest of your life. 
I want to know that you're going to be diving deep and knowing your detail. If I say to somebody, do you know the answer to that question? Don't bullshit me. You'll have read five levels down. You'll know and I'll trust you. And then sometimes you have to argue. We call it have backbone. Now you argue politely. You attack the process, not the person. You don't become abrasive. You don't become hostile. You have an intellectual dispute and then you agree on the goal and you move forward. And ultimately business is about delivering results. In a capitalist economy, it's earnings per share and growth for the shareholder. And your duties are to your customer first, right? Your employees second and your shareholders third. You can have arguments about that, but if you don't have customers, the shareholders don't exist. If you don't have employees, the shareholders won't get a return. So as a CEO, you really have to wrestle with who's my duty to, and I think it's customer first, employee second, shareholder third. And when you're paying attention to your shareholder and you screw your customers, you end up like United Airlines dragging people off planes, right? Great shareholder result, not really. So make sure you're delivering the right results, and that's kind of my thoughts on how you succeed. Please reward me with at least three questions, or else I'm going to go home depressed. Because <laughs> it meant either you were really bored, or you didn't understand a word I said, which might be both. Can I get three questions as a reward? What are you seeing in the difference between the cultures of South Orange County, where I live as well, versus Silicon Valley versus Seattle, in terms of the young people joining, the mid-career people joining, Okay, really interesting question. Um, you know, first of all, America is an incredibly diverse place. Uh, so, you know, South Orange County, I lived in Laguna Beach. I ran a company in San Juan Capistrano, El Segundo, and Irvine. Um, South or California is diverse. So or the same, there's, there's similar people in Orange County to Silicon Valley. Now, Silicon Valley, Santa Clara County has a million engineers. So Santa Clara is way more international. So there's a lot more international diversity in Santa Clara than there is in Orange County. Um, there's not enough capital in Orange County, so the problem in Orange County that I quit and left was there's only nine venture capital funds in Southern California. VCs do not like to fly to board meetings. The average VC partner theory is I can do seven boards. I want to drive to my board meetings. I do five board meetings a year, seven companies is 35 board meetings, and I can't fly to 35 boards, so therefore I drive to my boards. So there's 300 venture capital firms on Sand Hill Road, and there's nine in Southern Cal, and they're split between LA, Irvine, and, and San Diego. So getting a set of VCs that will fund you is a pain in the ass. So the problem with Southern Cal is lack, lack of capital. It's not lack of bright people. Silicon Valley, too many VCs with too many engineers and no loyalty. So engineers quit jobs after nine months. I don't like to hire people in Silicon Valley. Seattle, incredibly competitive between IBM, or sorry, between Microsoft and Amazon and now Apple and Salesforce are coming in. So now I've got too much competition for engineers, so I'm going to Vancouver, South Africa. Uh, I just opened up a team in Austin, so it's about competition for intellect. So equally good people, different macroeconomic factors, lack of capital, oversupply of capital, too much comp competition for engineers. Answer the question? Good answer. Next one. Thank you very, very much for your presentation. I'm Suvia Hert. I wanted to know a bit more about the empathy and social skills. You talked a lot about data and data analysis and such things. And now that we are facing the fourth industrial revolution, that's going to be one of the issues. So what do you make of the idea of like um, importance of the uh, social skills? As well? I really appreciate you asking that question because I probably didn't spend enough time on it. I did talk about earn trust um, and have backbone and disagree and commit. So, you know, it's, you guys are all incredibly bright, so you're weird. So, you know, out of the population of America, you're not normal. Okay, congratulations, you're a little abnormal. On the distribution curve, you know, you're in the top end of the curve, right? So you're in the end decile. So the reality is that the danger is you're high on I and you're deficient on E. And as you rise up a company, when you're an individual contributor and you're doing something on your own, the E doesn't matter as much. But when you move into a team, E is as important as I. And when you move up into leadership, E is more important than I. Right? You have to have enough eye that you don't mean demotivate your people and they go, my boss isn't very smart. On the other hand, if you've got no empathy, you can't motivate people. And you're going to resolve tensions with your peers. And the biggest skill in business when you move into middle and senior management is that you don't aggravate all your peers. And that is E. And so as you move up the ranks, what causes people to fail at the director and VP level is a lack of empathy. So we have to work on the human skills and we have to value it in the metrics we design into the business. And so we have to have a language about it and you have to have a conversation about it. And most companies have an IE index model. And whether it's the GE, Jack Welch, that's kind of going out of history, 2070 10 is gone. 
which used to be the, you know, the Jack Welsh model, that's gone. Now we're into a post-Jack Welsh world where we're trying to redesign compensation systems, goal setting systems, the language. Amazon just simplified our appraisal tool. I feel it's a little oversimplistic, but we're trying to change the language of reward and what are the right behaviours you want. But empathy is critical in a big company and a small company. Treat people well throughout life. You'll never be a bad outcome if you treat people well. Good question. Thank you. Quick question around as things become more digitized and more data is being circulated, can you talk about from the consumer standpoint the trade-off between security of what I want protected my own and versus a company knowing that versus the value in giving up that data and getting insights or improvements from the company? Wow, okay, that's, that, that's a talk on its own. <laughs> so uh, I'd be happy to come back and spend an hour and a half on that. Um, America is one of 205 countries in the world. We do not do well on information privacy. So if you stack rank the companies and countries in the world, I used to run compliance for IBM, so I have data on this. You know, Germany is country number one for information privacy. America ranks about number 35. Canadians do not want the data in America. We have this weird law that was passed in 1930 called the Law of Discovery. I ran an electronic evidence company where, you know, I can go to court and I want to get Brad's email and I want to sue him. I was involved in the lawsuit between Intel and AMD. It's the biggest lawsuit ever over I, I, IP. And 100 million emails were recovered. So I can go to court with a judge in a federal court and say, I want the CEO's email. And in America, the company says, sure, here it is. In Germany, they can't do that. You actually have to go to the CEO and the email belongs to the person. In America, the email belongs to the, the corporation. So culturally, we're not aligned with the rest of the world. So the rest of the world does not look at America as leaders in information privacy. They're like, whoa. So the reality is you can't have a homogenous answer. So data privacy, there's a new law coming out in Europe next year called GDPR, kicks in on the 28th of May. And if you run an e-commerce site, you have to be able to give the consumer everything back. And if I keep data on you next year on the 28th of May in Europe, it says, I want to know what data you're keeping on me and I have rights to tell you to take it down. American companies don't like that. So we're in a culture clash between Europe and America and it's going to play out across the world's economies and the OECD is the top 30 economies. So the reality is it's going to play out by vertical industry because they're all regulated differently. So it's a Rubik cube of vertical industry, country, power of supplier, power of consumer and culture. It's a fun, fun paper. <laughs> question. Uh, this is a very general question, but what advice would you give to a small team of a big data startup that's uh, in the process of getting offers from like accelerators or VCs and where to go and what the advantages of an accelerator versus an early seed investment would do for that kind of company. So get my email and I'll give you a better answer than I can in 30 seconds because I can't give you good service. The answer is, first of all, have a customer. If you're designing in a theory, don't bother. Get a customer, find a use case. Find a customer, find multiple customers with the same use case so you're actually coding the same thing. And have you got something that's compelling and has economic value to the buyer? And can you prove it repeatedly? And if you can prove that you've repeatedly delivered compelling value to the buyer, you will raise as much money as you want. If you have a concept in a lab with no customers, nobody will give you money. And then when you take angel money, be careful who they are, because all money is attached to a person, and a lot of people are not bright. So you can get their money, but you regret the relationship. And I did one company in Orange County where it was attached to a bunch of people who were clueless. And I got the five million, and I regretted it. So money is attached to people. Be attached to intellects you want to have a relationship with because you work for the money. And your, your freedom is delivery of compelling value. The source of capital, all capital is a contract. You just have to know how soon you're going to get screwed. It will happen. All right? So it's, it's a question of how long. Pardon that language. Hi. I had a question around your point of view on... Um uh, in addition to CIOs wanting to use software for like a few months, they're not sure about what they're going to do in two or three years from now. Yep. What are other things that you're noticing from technology executives who are maybe already running on the cloud and they're trying to take on big data technologies and modernize their architecture, but they don't really know how? This is just a quick, like, what are two other things you're seeing that CIOs are really... So IT is on? fractured. So there's the IT department that runs this stuff on-prem, keep my job. And there's the team that got told, move to the cloud, innovate, they don't agree. So there's, Gartner talks about this bimodal model, where if you go into a lot of companies, there's the CIO who says, I don't want everything. And then there's the VP who says, I run my data center, who's looking at cloud going, how soon am I laying people off? And there's the cloud team going, I need people who can write Java. So there's a skills transition going on, and a lot of companies have it. You know, the CIO says, I have a strategy, and then he leaves the room, and the VPs go, we don't agree. 
So they're not goal aligned, they're not on the same metrics, they're not really being honest with each other. So there's a lot of tension inside corporate IT. Now if you're a big bank and you have 30,000 people in seven locations, there's no coherence. So there's a lot of disruption going on in psychology, it's organizational change. So really you need to, who's setting the goals and what's the new things I have to learn? And then, you know, eventually jobs are going to go away and new jobs are going to happen. So the person who installs servers, not too good. Person who does data analytics, hire 4,000 of them. So there's a job transition, right? And that happens in all society. That's just normal. So there's lots of change going on. Does that help answer the question? All right. Thank you.